Good afternoon. This is Dr. Phil Stieg, and I am delighted to be able to present to you one of my partners and associates, Dr. Jared Notman, who is an associate professor at Weill Cornell Medicine and director of our endovascular service for the Department of Neurological Surgery, Brain and Spine Center at Weill Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital. Today, Jared is going to speak to you about one of the most common problems we are seeing in our emergency rooms because of the aging population. It's bleeding on the brain, and Dr. Notman has been one of the leaders and innovators in developing a new technology that is minimally invasive for the treatment of this disorder called chronic subdural hematomas. So with Great pleasure, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Jared Notman, who will go through his slide set. Jared, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stieg. Um, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to discuss what is a um, very common pathology, something that we see a lot of and something that we will see more and more of a, a, as time goes on, and that is chronic and, and subacute subdural hematomas. So. Chronic and subacute subdural hematomas are uh, issues, uh, is basically a pathology when blood builds up between the brain and the surface covering of the brain, which is called the dura. And what can happen is as that blood builds up, it can begin pressing on the brain and causing neurologic symptoms. It is a pathology that we commonly see in the elderly because as we age, our brain begins to actually shrink a little bit away from the covering of the brain and veins that traverse in that space can get torn and can bleed a little bit even after a minor head trauma such as a trip and fall or, or bumping of the head and when that blood builds up um, it starts to cause a lot of progressive neurological symptoms in this elderly population things like headaches uh, balance uh, abnormalities gait abnormalities neurologic deficits like weakness um, sometimes dizziness or even seizures and the mortality rates for treating these can actually be, or for developing these can actually be pretty high. A little over 10% of patients who develop subdural hematomas, um, it'll be fatal. And our symptomatic treatments for these uh, over the last 50 years has really been one uh, uh, treatment, which has been surgery. We can either put burr holes through the skull, we can make a window in the skull to remove the bone and drain the blood. But essentially we've been left with this uh, you know, single treatment arm for an elderly patient population that doesn't always do so well with surgery. And in fact, recurrence rates, meaning how often this subdural hematoma can come back after treatment are pretty high. About 15 to 20% of patients will get a recurrence and as high as 33% will require retreatment in the literature. And as we stated, whether or not this is a subdural hematoma which is recurred or a first time subdural hematoma, this is a very medically comorbid patient population that doesn't do well with anesthesia and doesn't do well with surgery. The main conundrum here is that this is going to be the most prevalent neurosurgical condition by 2030 with the aging patient population. So we're going to be running into a lot of these traditional problems more and more as time goes on. Now the cause for the subdural hematoma, as I alluded to, is when these veins which can travel in the space between the brain and the dura um, can tear. And as that space gets larger as we age, those veins are more prone to tearing. And it doesn't have to be a major fall to cause a bleed in the brain. Um, simply bumping one's head getting out of a car or on a kitchen cabinet is oftentimes enough to cause the requisite bleeding for these to build up. But what's interesting after this initial venous bleed is what keeps these chronic and subacute subdurals alive and present over time. Why, if a subdural hematoma bleeds a little bit, does the bleeding not stop in the subdural hematoma and not melt away? Well, what we find in a large percentage of our populations is that these subdural hematomas actually form lots of layers or membranes over time. And if you look on CAT scan, the blood in their brain is not all from one single instance. You have evidence of old blood, you have new blood, you have blood of mixed ages in the middle. And what that suggests is that even if a patient falls or hits their head one time and um, develops a small bleed, that bleed can enlarge with time because the subdural hematoma will spontaneously re-bleed on its own, even without subsequent trauma. And this is a very important concept, because what it means is that even if you prevent yourself from falling again or don't have another instance, um, the subdural hematoma can still enlarge and get worse with time. 
And the question we asked ourselves about a little over three years ago was, what causes these subdural hematomas to stay alive? What causes them to rebleed? What prevents them from melting away on their own? And, and ultimately, as they enlarge with time, um, what causes these, these neurologic deficits? And we hypothesized that even though the subdural hematoma originally formed from a vein that got torn during an initial fall, the subdural hematoma enlarges over time and stays alive because of small arteries that begin to feed the subdural hematoma. And this arterial supply is basically a completely new way of thinking about subdural hematomas. We always thought of these as venous pathologies that needed surgery. We never thought about the roles of arteries in their pathogenesis. And this is very important when we begin to move on to middle meningeal artery embolization, what we're gonna be speaking about today, because in that procedure, we're really addressing the arterial input, the arterial role of subdural hematoma. Well, just to take a step back when we discussed how we've traditionally treated these with surgery, which is addressing the, the venous role of subdural hematoma, um, what are the risks of doing surgery in a patient population that's a little bit elderly? Well, we have inherent risks of all surgeries, which is whenever you make an incision on the skin, there's always a risk of infection. But in this patient population, which we oftentimes have to keep in the ICU after surgery, flat in a bed for a day or two, um, we have lots of other risks that are associated with prolonged recovery and prolonged immobilization. Clots in the legs, such as deep venous thrombosis, can develop. Um, getting anesthesia and laying down in bed afterwards, not walking around, puts people at risk for developing respiratory and pneumonia complications. Um, pneumocephalus, which is a fancy way of saying air in the brain, is a complication whenever we open up the skull. And air in the brain, although itself is not necessarily terribly dangerous, it can slow down the healing process and make people um, a little bit uh, a little bit lethargic and out of it, and all of that adds to these other secondary risks. Um, anytime we're touching the brain, we have risk of causing bleeding or seizures to the brain surface. And obviously there's risks of general anesthesia anytime we do these procedures. So surgery in this patient population, which addresses the venous bleed, um, is associated with some immutable risks, which are made worse by the older patient population. So by transitioning and thinking about this, path, uh, this, this process as an arteriopathogenesis, perhaps there's a new way for us to attack subdural hematomas without surgery. And what we hypothesized a few years ago was that by taking the blood supply away to the subdural membrane, by shutting down the arteries in that region, it prevents those little arteries from, from forming and growing and rebleeding. And over time, this will allow the subdural hematoma to melt away. The middle meningeal artery is an artery that runs in the dura overlying the convexity or the uh, surface basically of the brain. And it's the main artery that we have found to be involved in keeping these subdural hematomas alive. And by interrupting the arterial supply to the subdural hematoma, we've added a lot more weapons uh, in our armamentarium to fighting this. In the first case, we can use this as a treatment modality to prevent that 15 to 20% recurrence rate that we see after surgery as well as to treat those patients who already had recurrences. And even more powerfully, we can use this treatment modality instead of surgery for patients who fail conservative therapy. So for those patients who have a small chronic subdural hematoma that doesn't go away with time, that begins to enlarge on its own, as we commonly see, if we embolize those patients early enough in their treatment course, we can actually make that subdural hematoma melt away without the need for surgery. So these were our two patient populations that we wanted to study. Those that had surgery, how would embolization affect its chances of coming back? And those who hadn't quite met the criteria for surgery, but could we avoid surgery in that patient population that would have traditionally received it in the past? Found, we found something very interesting when we started doing angiograms of the middle meningeal artery. An angiogram is when we go in through a minimally invasive needle stick in either the wrist or the artery in the leg and we put a catheter up. And it's a very short, safe procedure, but what we found is that when we look at the middle meningeal artery, that artery that runs in the dura, the covering over the brain, the middle meningeal artery has developed these small little fingers of smaller blood vessels that feed the subdural hematoma. And this finding, what's called hypertrophy or extra growth of the blood vessels is not noted in someone who doesn't have a chronic or a subacute subdural hematoma. So this really added to our hypothesis that arteries are involved in the development and growth of this disease, that it's not just a venous pathology. And those are the arteries that we essentially target when we're doing our embolization. So in this case, you're seeing 
pictures of embolic material that's in contrast. On the left, you see the, uh, if someone's looking head on at you from a frontal view, and on uh, the right side, you see the view from the side. But essentially what this image shows is that by injecting the embolic material, in this case, small particles, in the contrast, you see the contrast pooling in the same shape as the subdural hematoma. So this is, again, another radiographic suggestion of arteries playing a role in the development and pathogenesis of subdural hematomas. These were the first five patients that we treated, and they were also the first five patients worldwide to ever be treated with embolization instead of surgery. They all would have met traditional surgical criteria up until we developed this procedure, and they all would have, um, if this procedure weren't offered, received surgery because they had enlarging subdural hematomas that were causing symptoms and that were refractory to observation and conservative treatment. Conservative treatment really entails things like steroids and giving this time to, to, to resolve on its own. But once you've failed conservative treatment, which we know can occur in about 40 to 50% of patients with subdural hematoma, then treatment at that point is certainly necessary. Well, these patients had all failed conservative treatment and they all received MMA embolization instead of surgery as an upfront alternative. The nice thing about the procedure, you know, trying it on the first five people in the world was that if it didn't work or it failed, it didn't take surgery off the table. We still had our traditional tried and true procedure, but if it worked, we were able to avoid it. It was a, it was a complete bonus for them. And what you see on the top row are all five patients before they receive treatment. And what you see on the bottom row is their CAT scans after about six weeks of, six weeks of treatment, and each patient developed a marked resorption of their blood over the course of six weeks. Middle meningeal artery embolization interrupts the blood supply, and then over the course of a few weeks, the body organically resorbs the blood like it does any other blood in any other part of our body, as long as there's no rebleeding. And all these patients resorb their blood slowly over time. This was the case of a patient who had received three previous operations and recurred every single time um, their subdural hematoma. And finally, after the third operation, we performed an embolization to prevent recurrence at that point, and it, uh, or, or to treat the recurrence at that point, and indeed it, it worked and, and treated the recurrence, which otherwise would have required surgery. Our next seminal paper, which was published a few years later, was our first 60 patients. And if we study everybody and we looked at the three groups of patients who we treated, those who had embolization instead of surgery as a first-line treatment, those who had embolization for a symptomatic recurrence that would otherwise need surgery, and those who had embolization prophylactically as um, part of their surgery to prevent recurrence, what we found is that in those patients who met surgical criteria, so patients who up until a few years ago would have required surgery, we were able to avoid surgery in 92% of them. And this data has now borne out over the course of three plus years and in over 300 patients. We have the largest worldwide um, uh, numbers of treating these patients and in over 300 patients, we've seen greater than 90% efficacy rates in avoiding surgery in those patients who would have traditionally met criteria. So it's carried out over time. So just to summarize, um, we believe this is a very novel option for our patients. Um, firstly, it avoids a need for general anesthesia. We're offering a safe, minimally invasive treatment that doesn't require opening up the skull. And for an elderly patient population that develops these subdural hematomas and has multiple medical risk factors, the risk of an angiogram and embolization is markedly less than the risk of surgery. Um, it addresses the cause from hemorrhage on a microscopic level, um, noting the role of arteries in its pathogenesis. The indications in our practice for treatment of patients instead of surgery are those with mild to moderate symptoms, some gait abnormalities, some headaches or mild motor deficits, maybe a single seizure or some cognitive decline. If somebody comes in with a larger subdural hematoma or symptoms that are more severe, they get surgery and we can add this on as an adjunct to prevent recurrence. The nice thing is that if somebody's embolization doesn't work, if they fall into the 8% failure rate, it doesn't preclude them from getting the traditional treatment, but if it works, they've avoided surgery in nine out of 10 cases. Um, we are also able to use this procedure in our non-surgical patient population. So many patients who take anticoagulation, antiplatelet medications, those with leukemia or lymphoma that have poor clotting capacity or bleeding disorders, these have been patients where we've really had very limited treatment options for them traditionally. Well, we can do an embolization procedure on a patient who's on anticoagulation or has low platelets because we're not actually doing an open surgery. We don't need the same sort of hemostasis or blood clotting capacity. So we've applied this procedure even in the patient populations that we otherwise have no options for in the past.
after our uh, data, and now the data of other major academic medical centers, which has followed in our footsteps and found similar success rates, we're now gonna be performing a large randomized control trial. We're gonna be the national site um, and the principal investigator for a 40 uh, center randomized control trial utilizing a uh, embolic agent um, with the intention of having FDA approval for that agent for this treatment. This randomized control trial, which is starting up next month, it's going to take probably about two to three years, but will probably serve as the definitive trial um, to hopefully uh, designate a real indication for this procedure so that it, it, it carries with it um, widespread, um, widespread acceptance across the world. So we're, we're very excited about the next steps of this. Um, thank you again for having me uh, on today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the audience. Thanks, Dr. Notman. Um, the first question is about elderly patients. When you talk about elderly, what ages are you talking about? How old um, is too old? So there is um, no too old. We do see some hematomas in all ages, but for the most part, it's a rare, a relatively rare pathology below the, 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 the mid 60s, 70s in terms of age. We have performed this procedure up into patients in their 90s. Um, what's important is that as patients age their the vasculature, the arteries that take us um, endovascularly with a catheter up to the head, they can become more tortuous with time. So safety is the name of the game with this. If we get into a procedure and find someone has arteries or an anatomy that makes this procedure too difficult or too dangerous, we don't push it. Um, we keep the procedure complication rates, as I said, less than one third of 1%, but still in the vast majority of elderly patients with tortuous vasculature, we, um, we have been able to perform the procedure in about 300 procedures, we've probably only had to abort a procedure and not perform it uh, less than a handful of times due to um, vasculature that was just too tortuous. So I would not say that there's an age limit. I'd say there's an anatomic limit, but that anatomic limit is rarely encountered. Okay, the next question is about the price of this procedure compared to a twist drill. So a, an endovascular procedure is gonna be um, much more cost effective to the healthcare system than any surgical procedure, whether it's a twist drill, a craniotomy, or a burr hole. And one of the main reasons for that is the ancillary costs associated with any surgical procedure are going to be higher than an endovascular one. So, without having general anesthesia, that's a significant savings to the healthcare cost, uh, to the healthcare uh, uh, field. Without having an ICU stay, an overnight stay, um, that's a significant savings uh, to healthcare. So, um, these procedures are overall, I think, cost effective compared to our traditional treatments as well as um, uh, patient friendly. Okay, the next question is, can this uh, technique also be used for an aneurysm in the brain? Minimally invasive endovascular uh, techniques are um, absolutely used for aneurysms in the brain. In fact, they probably constitute our standard of care for over 90% of aneurysms today. Um, and it's, it's a similar procedure in the sense that we go in through a needle stick and we're not opening up the head and performing an open surgical treatment to treat the aneurysm. Um, it's a little different in that to be, do an aneurysm, we're going into the blood vessels of the brain itself. To do this procedure, we're actually going into the middle meningeal artery, which comes off a blood vessel that feeds the, the, the face and scalp. So we're not actually going into the blood vessels of the brain itself. But the concept of endovascular minimally invasive treatment with catheters to treat brain aneurysms uh, is absolutely very, very similar to this. Okay, next question is about the, the downside of blocking arterial blood supply. Um, do you reverse it once the hematoma is reabsorbed? It's a, it's a great question. We, we only take blood vessels that are, that are pathologic, meaning that we're only taking the blood vessels that go to the subdural hematoma, not to normal things in the brain or in the eye. And that's an important point because when we do our angiogram, we see exactly the blood vessels that we're shutting down and we make sure that we're not shutting down anything that's important. Um, we use materials that are both sometimes temporary, sometimes permanent. There's no difference in complication rates of using temporary versus permanent materials, as long as you're shutting down the blood vessels that go only to the subdural hematoma and not to other things. And um, that is uh, what makes this procedure so safe. And that's why it's important um, in thinking about getting this procedure that, that people get it done at a center that does a lot of this because um, uh, that knowledge of the anatomy of knowing what can and can't be shut down is obviously of the utmost importance, but in the right hands and with the right experience, it is eminently safe. 
next question is, are you looking at the risk of renal injury in the study, especially uh, in the angiogram? We have certain criteria for not subjecting a patient to, to uh, contrast um, if they have underlying renal problems. Um, essentially, uh, contrast can be a little toxic to the kidneys, uh, but that typically is found in patients with severe renal problems. Most patients, um, even with minor renal problems, are able to tolerate a small amount of contrast. This procedure is short. The contrast load isn't high. We will pre-medicate or, or, or pre-hydrate a patient to decrease the risk of kidney damage if there's any question of underlying kidney disease. We'll also use different types of contrast. They're a little bit less toxic on the kidneys if we're concerned about that. But that is not something that's gotten um, in our way um, in, in, in routinely at all. Okay, the next question is, would this work in chronic subdural hygroma? So chronic subdural hygroma ends up being a little bit more similar in cerebrospinal fluid than actual blood. If there's components of a hygroma that have blood in it, in which case we think the hygroma is a really late stage breakdown product of bleeding, then possibly. But most subdural hygromas, if they're hygromas, haven't bled in a very long time, even if they started out as hematomas. So we're not really chasing subdural hygroma in many, um, in many patients. Um, we are performing this in some cases on patients who have uh, shunt-related subdural uh, collections. And a lot of times those shunt-related collections can be primarily CSF, but there is a component of blood in them. And if someone still has that collection despite dialing up or turning off a shunt or tying off or removing a shunt. We have seen success in that patient population too, but a pure subdural hygroma that doesn't have hemorrhage or blood products in it, um, I, I, I wouldn't use that. this procedure as really a, um, a first-line treatment for that in all likelihood. Okay, that's a good segue to the next one. Would you offer MMA embolization as a first-line intervention or only after recurrence after surgical intervention? So I would offer it absolutely as a first-line intervention because I think it's most powerful applicability as in those patients who have the opportunity to have it instead of surgery. There's no doubt that it, it, it is a nice adjunct to surgery to prevent recurrence. What we found in our series is that our recurrence rates drop down from that 15 to 20 percent historical levels to 3.6 percent. So we know that MMA is a uh, embolization is a nice adjunct to surgery, but where I think its most powerful application is instead of surgery. It's a select group who can get this instead of surgery who would otherwise require surgery. It requires very good follow-up with the patient or their family because if a patient gets the procedure and gets worse over the course of two to three weeks because the subdural hematoma hasn't melted away yet or hasn't melted away quick enough, you need a family member or someone around the patient to tell you that maybe the patient's not healing fast enough and, and does need surgery. But I think for those patients who have, for example, a one and a half centimeter subdural with three or four millimeters of midline shift and some mild to moderate symptoms that would traditionally meet the criteria for a borehole, I think if that patient has um, uh, a good family around and you can speak to them and good follow-up, that is a perfect patient to try embolization on instead of surgery and see if it works. And we've seen a lot of success in that exact patient, which is our typical chronic subdural hematoma patient. And we've, we've saved them the burr hole or the craniotomy or, and the anesthesia and, and everything that goes with it. So I think in both categories, it's, it's, it's very effective and powerful. Okay, the next question is about clipping. Can you clip the MMA where it comes off the maxillary artery in the neck? Yes, so the MMA comes off um, the maxillary artery kind of at the skull base and by cauterizing or clipping or shutting down that that branch, you're definitely decreasing blood supply to the to the you know calvarium to, to the excuse me to the to the dura on that side, and surgically we actually when we take these out have cauterized the MMA where we see it. The issue with that is that we're not getting anything into the small arterioles, those small fingers that have grown from the MMA to the subdural hematoma. By embolizing, you're getting the material, whether it's a liquid embolic agent or a particle all the way out to those little capillaries. So you're getting it to those subdural membranes. If you clip or ligate or cauterize the middle meningeal artery down by the skull base here, it still leaves those, those fingers alive and they can collateralize with new blood vessels to feed them. But if you embolize those little arterioles, those small blood vessels at the level of the subdural membrane, then it doesn't really matter what collateralizes in, you've already shut everything down. So MMA ligation or cauterization or clipping at the level of the skull base, I don't think would have 
a positive impact on the natural history or pathogenesis of this because you're not getting your embolic material into the um, um, uh, middle meningeal artery arterioles themselves. It's kind of like why embolizing or shutting down a major branch that feeds an AVM doesn't treat the AVM. You need to get the embolic material into the AVM itself or the AV fistula itself. That same concept holds for embolization of subdurals as well. Okay, the next question is, how long have you been testing this and how long do you expect the clinical trial to last? We started uh, doing this ourselves back in 2017 and of 2016, so about three plus years, a little over three years at this point. The clinical trial will probably run about two plus years um, starting next month. Okay. Um, we have time for probably one more question before our half hour is up. Uh, question is, if a neurointerventionalist was not available, could a cardiologist do this procedure? I would not have a cardiologist do this procedure. The, the, the whole reason this procedure is safe is because it's done by interventionalists that specialize in the brain. There are important collateral blood vessels that can feed neural tissue that are not obvious unless you do this every day, um, all the time, and in, and in high volume. In order to keep this procedure safe, it should be done by someone that has um, uh, highly experienced and immense knowledge of small collateral blood vessels that go to the brain. So I would restrict this procedure to people who have fellowship training in neurointerventional techniques. Okay, I think our time is up and I don't see any further questions. Um, so with that, thank you very much, Dr. Notman, and thank you, Dr. Stieg, and thanks to everyone who attended today. Thank you very much.